Hello, this is Catherine from Accelerated Reader, reading books for you. Today, I will be reading chapters 17 and 18 from Two Very Rare Bears by S.P. Bullock and G.S. Worth. Before I begin reading, I would like to give a big thanks to the authors for sending me this book to read on my channel. In the description below, I've included links for me to find and purchase this book. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Chapter 17 Churchill's longest serving doormen were Martin and Rob. They were used to dealing with the wealthy customers that frequented the store. The rich and famous came in droves from all over the world to shop in London's finest store. Ex Cockney cab driver Ray Morgan was a newcomer too. The Millionaires Club, after winning a staggering £78 million on the Euro Lottery two years ago. His wife, Stacy, and their beloved only daughter, Chelsea, whom Ray had named after his favorite football club, was also known as Billions, as she was worth her weight in gold and couldn't spend her father's money fast enough. Martin and Rob always smiled at each other when Ray's Rolls Royce pulled up and parked illegally outside Churchill's front doors, and today was no exception. Ray emerged from behind the blackened out windows with his trademark dark sunglasses, cigar, and his huge gold Rolex watch, which had earned him the nickname Rolex Ray. Ray laughed as a traffic warden slapped a 100 pound fine on his windscreen. This amused Rob and Martin as they knew Ray long before his huge win. All right, boys, Ray said to Rob and Martin. Evening, Ray, said Martin. Christmas shopping, are we? said Rob. Yeah, treating my girls replied Ray. Just then, the back door of the Rolls Royce swung open and out stepped Stacy Morgan. She was wearing six-inch jewel-encrusted high heels, leopard print trousers, and a garish designer pink hoodie. Her overly manicured hand adjusted her sunglasses as she flicked her long, bleached hair out of her face. Come on, billions, let's spend daddy's cash, said Stacy. Chelsea jumped out of the back of the rolls, glued to her mobile phone and chewing gum. She was only nine years old and already an unbelievably spoilt child. Dressed from head to toe in the latest designer gear with over 30,000 Instagram followers, Chelsea knew exactly what she wanted which was basically everything. As Ray, Stacy, and Chelsea walked through Churchill's front door, Ray tried to slip Rob and Martin 100 pounds each as he said, watch the motor boys. Sorry, Ray, said Martin, we can't accept tips. Put it in the charity box then, said Ray. As he walked into the store, gleefully rubbing his hands, he turned to Stacy and Chelsea. Right, girls, he said. Go fill your boots. Buy anything you want. Let's have a Christmas to remember. And with that, the greedy spending spree began. Auntie Maggie and family were by now just around the corner from Churchill's famous front doors. Everybody ready? said Maggie. Ready? Everyone replied. Harry's little heart was racing. He was hopefully minutes away from being reunited with George. They turned a corner and there it was. The world famous Churchill's department store lit up with thousands of twinkling lights. It looked magical against the winter sky. Wow, said Tom. It's amazing, said Emily. No wonder you love it here, said Eva to Auntie Maggie. It's just magical, said Maggie, 
taking Eva's hand. James turned to Grandma. Does Santa Claus live here? He lives in Lapland, James, said Grandma. I bet he would rather live here, said James. Grandma and Grandpa smiled at each other. James's little observations always amused them, and they were such good, kind children. They never asked for anything, quite the opposite of the precocious, spoiled Chelsea Morgan. As they approached, Martin and Rob opened the front doors for them. Good evening, said Rob. Good evening, said Grandpa. Tom and Harry wheeled straight onto the smooth marble floor. The rest of the family followed closely behind. Auntie Maggie was giddy with excitement. She so loved Churchill's. Emily and Eva were studying the layout. Toy department, top floor, said Emily. They all headed for the elevators. They had no time to lose. Emily pressed the button and they all stood staring as the floor slid up. The tension was unbearable. The children's stomachs were churning. Please let George still be there, thought Harry. Once they were in the elevator, it seemed to move very slowly up through the floors. Various people got in and out, and it all seemed to be happening in slow motion. Finally, the lift pinged, and they arrived at the toy department. Eva pulled out the hand-drawn floor plan from her pocket, the one Harry had drawn in Tom's bedroom. The floors opened and they all stepped out like a little army preparing for battle. As they all looked up, there it was, the magnificent Christmas tree, exactly as in Harry's plan. Harry, who up until now had managed to stay still, started moving around. Tom worried someone would see, and he asked Emily for her bag, so he could place it in front of Harry on his knee so no one would notice him. Further down the shop floor, they could see the large wicker baskets, which, according to Harry's drawings, contained the doggy bears. The largest one to the left was where he had last seen George. As quickly as they could, they rushed towards the basket. To their surprise, the basket was completely empty. They ran over to the second basket, only to be confronted by the same awful sight. It was totally empty. Tom felt sick. There must be more over the other side, said Emily. Just then, a member of staff brushed past the entire family, holding a large microphone. Harry recognized the bony fingers holding the microphone. It was Winifred Draycott, the hand that had plucked him from the basket for the Christmas hamper. Chapter 18 Clearing her throat, Winifred made an announcement over the speaker system. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sorry to announce that we have just sold out of this year's Christmas doggy bears. If you would like to order one for next year, please let a member of staff know. Thank you and Merry Christmas from Churchill's. That was it. The children's hearts sank. Grandma and Auntie Maggie didn't know what to say. Grandpa placed his hand on Tom's shoulder and said, I'm sorry, son. We tried our best. They all then looked down at Harry as tears rolled down his furry cheeks. Thank you, everyone, said Harry. I can't thank you enough for trying. Let's just hope George has found a lovely family like I have. But just then, out of the corner of Harry's eye, something caught his attention. Something was moving, and that something was George. For High above their heads, from the top of the Christmas tree, George had already spotted his brother Harry on Tom's lap, and he was waving furiously, hoping to get Harry's attention, which he indeed had done. He's, he's up there, shouted Harry. 
What do you mean he's up there? said Tom. The top of the Christmas tree. He's up there waving. Everyone looked up, and there was George, waving down at Harry. Harry realized George must have been hiding in the tree, waiting for him to come back. It was unbelievable. Harry had done it. He had found George. George just needed to carefully climb down without anyone seeing him. George was pondering the best route down when a high pitched shriek filled the air. Yes, yes, yes! There's one there, Daddy. There's a doggy bear at the top of the tree. Daddy, up there, Daddy. Chelsea Morgan had heard Winifred's announcement and raced to the toy department. For at the top of her Christmas list was a Churchill's Christmas doggy bear. There's one there, she squealed. I want it, I want it, I want it, pointing to the top of the tree. She had spotted George. Tom couldn't believe what he was hearing. Winifred had now appeared to see what all the commotion was. Excuse me, darling, said Ray to Winifred. We've just heard over the store announcement that there ain't any Christmas doggy bears left. That's correct, said Winifred. We have no doggy bears left. I am awfully sorry, sir. That ain't right, said Ray, pointing to the top of the Christmas tree. What's that up there, then? he said to Winifred. What's what? said Winifred. That Churchill's bear at the top of your tree, he replied. Winifred looked up and saw George, who didn't dare move because he knew it would make the situation worse. I'm sorry, sir, but that bear must be part of the Churchill's Christmas display, and Neil, my assistant, must have placed it there, and he's not in Churchill's until tomorrow morning, so I'm sorry, sir. But you will have to come back then. Nah, darling, I ain't got time to come back tomorrow. We'll just buy it now. I just told you, sir, we can't get up that tree until tomorrow morning. We're not insured. Chelsea started stamping her feet. I want it now, she cried. I'll give you one hundred pounds for it now, said Ray. Sorry, sir. Insurance says we can't, said Winifred. And with that, Winifred walked off. Chelsea started crying her eyes out. You said I could have one, Daddy, she wailed. Don't you worry, darling. Daddy will make sure you get your doggy bear. Tom, Harry, and the whole family were now listening. They had overheard the entire conversation between Ray and Winifred. Now, thinking Ray and his dreadful daughter could do nothing until the morning, they sighed with relief, and George could still climb down the tree when nobody was looking. This feeling was short lived as Ray turned to his wife Stacy, who was by now trying to comfort the whining Chelsea, and said, Watch this. Nobody tells my billions she can't have something. And with his big, brutish hands, he started rocking and shaking the giant Christmas tree. Oh no, thought Harry. Baubles and decorations started dropping from the tree, and little George was clinging on for dear life, as the giant tree swayed from side to side. Auntie Maggie was enraged. What on earth are you doing? she shouted at Ray. You were just told you had to come back tomorrow morning. I ain't listening to you, missus. My daughter wants that bear, and I'm getting it for her, shouted Ray. Eva and Emily were by now running towards a shop assistant to get help. They had to stop Ray before he shook George out of the tree and into Chelsea's greedy clutches. Go on, Dad, shouted Chelsea. Is it tied on? said Stacy. He ain't moving. By now, the shop floor was covered with decorations from the tree. 
everyone on the toy department floor was staring at the commotion. As Ray swung the tree furiously from side to side, people were ducking as tinsel and baubles were flying everywhere. Keep going, Daddy. He's coming loose, Chelsea screamed. George was losing his grip and suddenly went flying through the air. Tom and Harry watched helplessly as he then landed in the outstretched arms of Chelsea Morgan, who started jumping up and down with glee. You did it! You did it, Daddy, she said. Of course I did, darling, said Ray, removing his overcoat, as by now he was sweating profusely. What my little girl wants, my little girl gets. Auntie Maggie started shouting at Ray, You can't take that bear, it's not yours, and you've ruined the display. She was stalling for time, as she could see help was coming. With Eva and Emily, they had managed to alert Winifred Draycott. What on earth has happened? shrieked Winifred. I've only been gone for five minutes, and the shop floor is carnage. It's that man, he's taken the bear, said Maggie. But Winifred wasn't interested in any doggy bear. She was too distressed by the state of the Christmas display. The Morgans had quickly made for the escalators in the middle of the floor. Now they had what they wanted. Chelsea held George along with an armful of other toys. We'll pay down on the bottom floor, girls, said Ray, as they descended down from the toy department. You ain't lost your touch, Ray, said Stacy. I do love a strong man. Stay tuned for chapters 19 and 20. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. In the description below, I've included links where we find and purchase this book.